We'll prepare ourselves this morning in our usual fashion. We'll have a few moments of silent prayer, and during that time we have the opportunity to name privately to God the Father any unconfessed sins which ensures the filling of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your faithfulness and the fact that you are the God of freedom and you give us our rights that come from you to be able to be free. We thank you for those who have gone before us and those who are on the fields today across the country, across the land, the world, that are putting their life on the line in order to protect us And we honor those today who have given their last measure of devotion by giving their very lives in order to maintain our freedom. So we pray that you will help us to focus and concentrate as we remember them today. For we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Well, today is Memorial Day. And the first thing that comes to mind is that freedom is not free. Never has been and never will be. Freedom is gained through victory on the battlefield. That means the only way that we can remain free is kill those enemies that would take it, take it from us. And you wish it wouldn't be that way, but that is the way things are. General Douglas MacArthur said, there is no substitute for victory on the battlefield. And we are on a battlefield. We're in the Engaged in a great of greatest wars, which is the angelic conflict, and we're in that battle every single day. Americans throughout history have been willing to risk their lives and to kill the enemy of our country so that we can be free. And we have one in our midst today who has volunteered to join that hallowed group. On June the second, Caleb Hare will go into the OCS. Officers Cadet School, I believe is what that stands for, to become one of the few, the proud, the Marines. <laughs> We're very proud of him, and we need to uh, pray for him and double down on that effort starting uh, June the 2nd. And he's going to send me his address Italian number or whatever the that is, and I'm going to give it to you and expect him to get a lot of letters. And so we want to pray and we want to write to him. The spiritual vigor of a nation and the true security of a nation are one and the same. It doesn't matter how many missiles you have, how many nuclear bombs or anything else, it is the spiritual vigor of a nation that is the true security of a nation. I'd like for you to turn in your Bible to Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 1. Now, Nehemiah is on the left side of the Psalms. In other words, it's, it's a few books to the left. If you can find Esther, I mean, uh, Job is right to the left of Psalms, then you have Esther, and then you have Nehemiah. Nehemiah. Nehemiah was called by God to take those people who had been in exile and back to Israel and to build the wall. And in Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 1, we'll pick up the narrative there, and we're going to read 23 verses. That's the entire chapter. And think about this as to where we are in our history and what is going on here. Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 1. Now it came about when Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became furious and very angry and mocked 
the Jews. And he spoke in the presence of his brothers and the wealthy men of Samaria and said, What are these feeble Jews doing? Of course, these were the enemies of the Jews. They hated the Jews. And now we have this leader maligning them. Are they going to restore it for themselves? In other words, he's talking about restoring the wall. And this is mocking. This is making light of them. He he thought there's no way they can do that. Can they offer sacrifices? Can they finish in a day? The reason he's saying can they finish in a day is is essentially he's saying they better finish in, in a day because if they don't, we're going to come in and destroy it and destroy them. Can they revive the stones from the dusty rubble, even the burnt ones? Now, Tobiah the Ammonite was near him, and he said, Even what are they building? If a fox should jump on it, he would break the stone the stone wall down. So he's, you see, he's making light, mocking it, like they're going to do such a poor job if a fox got on it, it, was just, it would just tear it down. Verse 4. Hear, O Israel, how we are despised. Return their reproach upon their own heads and give them up for plunder in a land of captivity. Do not forgive their iniquity and let not their sin be blotted out before thee, for they have demoralized the builders. So we built the wall and the whole wall was joined together to half its height for the people had a mind to work. Now what this is talking about is is this is an imprecatory prayer and that was that was uh, legitimate in the Old Testament and he's asking God, this is Nehemiah starting verse 4, saying, will you bring down your wrath on them because they have nothing but uh, ruin and destruction in mind for us. And then he says, uh, they built the wall halfway up half its height that it was before. And so this is getting the attention of the neighbors of the Israelites and they're not happy about it because they want them to be defenseless so they can continue to mock them and subjugate them. Verse 7. Now it came about when Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, and the Ammonites, and the Ashadites heard that the repair of the walls of Jerusalem went on and that the breaches began to be closed, they were very angry. So they saw the the, the breaches, the holes in the wall. They were getting fortified. They became very angry. And there are countries, I think about this, I think about how after uh, eight years of nothing happening uh, as far as uh, strength in our country and our military being decimated, now we're building back up to be a a strong nation again and the other nations that would take advantage uh, advantage of us or try to uh, destroy us or harm us in some way, they have the same idea that these guys have. They're not happy about it. Verse 8. And all of them conspired together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to cause disturbance in it. Now verse 9, I want you to get your pen out and look at the first thing they do but we pray to our God that's the first thing we do in any situation we go to the Lord in prayer but we pray to our God and because of them we set up a guard against them day and night very vigilant here thus in Judah it was said the strength of the burden bearers is failing yet there is much rubbish We ourselves are unable to rebuild the wall. Now this is always the case. You have the naysayers. You have the people that say, we can't. And so they have to deal with that as well. Verse 11. And our enemies said, they will not know or see until we come among them, kill them, and put a stop to their work. So the enemy is uh, really waging psychological warfare here, trying to scare the people and disrupt them. Verse 12. And it came about when the Jews who lived near them came and told us ten times they will come up against us from every place 
where you may turn. So you have this happening all the time. The naysayers, those who are afraid, they're not trusting God, and they are incessant in saying what we need to do is forget about the wall. Let's go back home to our families. Verse 13. Then I stationed men in the lowest parts of the space behind the wall, the exposed places, and I stationed the people in families with their swords, spears, and bows. So they prayed, but they're also ready. That's tantamount to uh, speak softly, but carry a big stick. Verse 14. Then I saw their fear. I rose and spoke. Now here's a leader doing the right thing here. He's not just ignoring their concerns. Then I saw their fear. I rose and spoke to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people. This is what he said. Do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord. See, that's what dispels fear, is when you're remembering the Lord, you're forgetting about your fear, and you're trusting in Him. Do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, who is great and awesome, and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. This is what the job is for, uh, the, at least the men, are to fight for those they love and what they have. Verse 15. And it happened when our enemies heard that it was known to us and that God had frustrated their plan, then all of us returned to the wall, each one to his work. So they took just a little break to get organized, to get ready for an assault. And then when they, what happened when the nations heard their enemies? Uh, they decided they, they better rethink this because these people aren't stupid. And they're armed and they're ready. Verse 16. And it came about from that day on that half of my servants carried on the work. This would be the laborers. While half of them held the spears and the shields and bows and the breastplates. And the captains were behind the whole house of Judah. So the laborers carried on their work while the others were in full array ready for battle. Verse 17, for those who were rebuilding the wall and those who carried the burdens took their load with one hand doing the work and the other holding a weapon. So if you're a, a bricklayer or a trial, you have a trial in one hand and you have your sword or your, or your spear or something in the other. Verse 18, as for the builders, each wore his sword girded at his side as he built, while the trumpeter stood near me. So the trumpeter was ready, so they didn't have uh, electronic communications, but the trumpet would sound the alarm, and they were all knew what to do when the trumpet sounded. Verse 19, And I said to the nobles of the officials and the rest of the people, The work is great, extensive, and we are separated on the wall far from one another, at whatever place you hear the sound of the trumpet, re re rally to us there. Our God will fight for us. Underline that. That is what gives courage and strength to the people. Is to remember that God will fight for us. When we are obedient, when we are doing his will, God's going to fight for us. Verse 21. So we carried on the work with half of them holding spears from dawn until the stars appeared. At that time, I also said to the people, let each man with his servant spend the night within Jerusalem so that they may be a guard for us by night and a laborer by day. So at night, it was safer in Jerusalem. Verse 23, so neither I, my brothers, my servants, nor the men of the guard who followed me, none of us removed our clothes, each took his weapon even to the water. Now what that means is when they went to the whatever water it was, probably a river, creek, or something, to bathe, they didn't even take off their clothes or their weapons then. Now that is being vigilant, and the enemy took note of that, and uh, they didn't want any part of Israel at that time. So this tells us that freedom is certainly worth fighting for, and the sacrifices to keep it are high. Price is high, but it's worth it. 
As is always the case, our freedom is under threat, but the greatest threat of our freedom is not from foreign countries, but from our own leaders. Possibly what is the most disturbing to think about the horrible suffering and sacrifices that have been made in order to bequeath to us our precious freedom is how foolishly and easily we are allowing it to be taken from us by self-serving, ungodly, lying, despicable politicians. It is our custom to read a Medal of Honor citation every Memorial Day, so I have one for, for you here. This comes from the Medal of Honor recipients, and the one that we, we're going to uh, here today is, his name is Drew Dennis Dix. He was a staff, staff sergeant in the U.S. Army. Battle, our place of action was Chow Doc Province, Republic of Vietnam. The date of action was January the 31st. He received his Medal of Honor at the White House from President Lyndon B. Johnson. This is how the citation reads. For conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity in action at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty, Sergeant Dix distinguished himself by exceptional heroism while serving as a unit advisor. Keep that in mind. He was a unit advisor. I don't know what you think when you think of an advisor, but I think about somebody with a clipboard walking around taking notes. Two heavily armed Viet Cong battalions attacked the province capital city, Chao Pu, resulting in the complete breakdown and fragmentation of the defense of the city. Sergeant Dix, with a patrol of Vietnamese, Vietnamese soldiers, was recalled to assist in the defense of Chao Pu. Learning that a nurse was trapped in a house near the city center of the city, Sergeant Dix organized a relief force, successfully rescued the nurse, and returned her to the safety of the tactical operations center. Being informed of others trapped within the city, Sergeant Dix voluntarily led another force to rescue eight civilian, civilian employees located in a building which was under heavy mortar and small arms fire. Sergeant Dix then returned to the center of the city. Upon approaching a building, he was subjected to intense automatic fire and machine gun fire from an unknown number of Viet Cong. He personally assaulted the building. This isn't the first time it says he personally. That means by himself. Personally assaulted the building, killing six Viet Cong and rescuing two Filipinos. The following day, Sergeant Dix still on his own volition, assembled a 20-man force and, though under intense enemy fire, cleared the Viet Cong out of their hotel and the theater and other adjacent buildings within the city. During this portion of the attack, the Army of Republic of Vietnam soldiers, inspired by the heroism and success of Sergeant Dix, rallied and commenced firing upon the Viet Cong. Sergeant Dix captured 20 prisoners, including a high-ranking Viet Cong official. Then he attacked enemy troops who had entered the residence of the deputy province chief and was successful in rescuing the official's wife and children. Sergeant Dix's personal heroic actions resulted in 14 confirmed Viet Cong, Viet Cong killed in action and possibly 25 more. The capture of 20 prisoners 15 weapons, and the rescue of the 14 United States and free world civilians. His heroism of Sergeant Dix was in the highest traditions and reflects the great credit of the U.S. Army. And remember, he was an advisor. Of course, we are in a battle as well. We call it the angelic conflict, and we need to be just as ready 
This is our weapon. We need to know it. We need to be able to use it. And it is the way that we can uh, be good and faithful servants. The commander-in-chief is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of the armies. And to fail to heed the warnings and not be ready and not to obey his commands is to go into slavery against those who would do us harm. I want you to just jot this down. I'm not going to read it this morning, but I want you to be able to read it. Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 10 through 15. What those verses are, are the opposite of what we see in the uh, scriptures we just read in Nehemiah. They're just the opposite. So you want to jot that down and maybe you can read it later. That's Yes, it's Jeremiah, chapter 6, verse 10 through 15. Or you could just start at verse 1 and start reading through, but that's, that's the, the main part that I wanted you to... That's the, that's the other side of the coin from what Nehemiah did. These are people who think they're on easy street and that they can ignore about God and still, save, save, still stay safe and free. Okay, now I'm done with this part of the service, which was uh, for Memorial Day. And now I would like you to turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 12 and verse 7. Genesis chapter 12 and verse 7. Genesis chapter 12, verse 7. And the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. I don't see where the Lord ever said he gave the land to Abram, whose name was changed to Abraham. But he did promise to give it to him, to, excuse me, to his descendants. And that may be one reason that he never had a, a, a solid structure to live in. He always lived in a tent. Because he was looking for a land and a city that the Lord would build. We'll get to that in a moment. First, let's look at this. Your descendants, I will give this land. This promise was made several times because it's very important. You might want to jot these down. Genesis chapter 13, verse 15. Genesis 15, 18. Genesis 17, 7 and 8. And Galatians 3, 16. God gave the land to Israel and no one else. Israel has legitimate claim to that land because none other than God himself gave it to them. And we talk, he talks about building an altar. So he built an altar there to the Lord who appeared to him. Though generally erected for offering a sacrifice, in some instances they appear, that would be altars, appear to have been only memorials. That's what this would be. It is a memorial. When God comes to talk to you personally, you would want to commemorate that, and that's what this altar was for. Sometimes the altar was for sacrificing, sometimes as a memorial. Here are a few examples of it being a memorial. Genesis chapter 12, verse 7, which is our verse. Exodus 17, 15 and 16. Exodus 17, 15 and 16. Altars were most probably originally made of earth. The law of Moses allowed them to be made of either earth or unhewn stone. So a lot of them were stone, or else just you just get dirt and pile it up. There's no stones around. The reason they the Mosaic 
law did not allow them to put a chisel to stone when building an altar is because that's the custom of the pagans. And God didn't want them to do anything that even came close as to what the pagans did. So the scripture shows that Abram built an altar to God five times, if you want to jot these down. For these are all special times because they would commemorate something that was special. Genesis chapter 12, 7 is our verse, and this altar was built in Shechem, S-H-E-C-H-E-M. The next one was in Bethel, B-E-T-H-E-L. And that's in Genesis 13 through 18. Excuse me. Genesis 12, 8. I had the verse on the other side. So one in Genesis 12, 7 was in Shechem. In Bethel, it was Genesis 12, 8. In Hebron, H-E-B-R-O-N, is Genesis 13, 18. Bethel, by the way, is capital B-E-T-H-E-L, and it means the house of God. And then there was one built on Mount Moriah, Genesis 22, 9. This is all done by Abraham. And then in Beersheba, Genesis 26, 35. And I would say, if God appeared to us and talked to us, we would be inclined to build something as well as a memorial, but that doesn't happen in the church age. That was for the Old Testament times. Now, did God command Abram to build this altar? No. And I asked you this last Sunday, and I don't remember if you answered or not, but I'll give you another chance. Who else can you think of who built an altar, altar that was not commanded to do so? Noah, right, we already went over that, Noah. When he got off the ark, he did it as a memorial and a thanksgiving that God saved him from the flood. Now, Bethel mean, uh, means the house of God, and I thought I would show you a few PowerPoints here that have to do with altars. Go ahead, George. Those in the middle as well. This one, there you go. Thank you. There's different types of altars. Here's a few that come to mind. These were the ones, uh, any stone. Sometimes they would just have a, a big rock and they would maybe put some small rocks around it or something and it would be a memorial or maybe a place of sacrifice. Uh, this is a, a rectangular mound. They would just mound up dirt and brush and all, so if that's all they had. Here is unworked stone. See, they just would take stones of different size and, and make an a, a altar from it. This is a more elaborate one, a movable bronze-covered uh, wood. Wood, this was... They would put uh, sacri this was more for making sacrifices on it. And here's work stones with horns. I'll show you in a minute. These little deals on each corner were called horns. And one reason they would have those is when they would put a sacrifice on it, they would tie it down and they would dally around those corners to hold it down. And then, and they're also symbolic. Here is a, a tiered stone where the, this is a big elaborate one. And then the, this is a solid bronze stone. Solomon, I believe, had a had an altar like that when he dedicated the temple. Then we have this is just an old probably more of the type in Abraham's day would look like that. Here's one. See, here, these are the horns here that they would put on there. Here's one. A, a, See, they would, it's about high enough to where if you had a, like a sheep or something, you could throw it up on there about table high so they could do what they needed to do there. And here's one that was, this no doubt is an artifact where they had a, see how they just took the, little, little, the stones like this and built them up to make an altar. 
And here's, I thought this is pretty neat. This, this, I could picture uh, Abram just building up stones like that. Now, he didn't sacrifice on the one we're talking about, but that's something that he would, uh, I don't know, this could be, that looks like it might be a, a boat or ark. Maybe they think this is uh, Noah when he came off the ark and was sacrificing animals. Here's one. This is artifacts as well uh, that we see. I just want to give you a flavor for what those look like. Okay. Um, so let's go to our next scripture here. Okay. Uh, Let's, let's, we didn't read about him going down to Bethel yet, have we? Okay. Okay, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Verse 8. Then he, Abram, proceeded from there to the mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. So this wasn't that far. Let me go back to the PowerPoint for a moment. I have a map. Can you feel that, George? Okay. Remember, this This shows when, what happened in Haran? I'm not going to tell you. You tell me. What happened in Haran? Yeah, his father died, which prompted Abram to come on down. And down to here is 400 miles, thereabouts. And he comes down to Shechem, and he sacrificed there. And then he goes down to Bethel. And he's going to be between Bethel and Ai, and he's going to make another another altar. Now, from Shechem here to Bethel was 20 miles, and this you can't see these very. This is Ai. See that black dot right there? That's Ai, and this is Bethel. So when he came down here, this uh, sacrifice, this altar was right in between those two. Uh, cities, and if this is 20 miles, this isn't very, very much space. This is where he did it. I was wondering, this is the Dead Sea, the, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, the Sea of Galilee, this is the Jordan, this is the Mediterranean over here. There, this is just showing a little better. This is where he had that. Okay. Just want to give you an orientation as to where this was taking place. You can still go to Israel today and find some of these. Now, verse uh, 9. And Abram journeyed on continuing, continuing toward the Negev. Now, the Negev is the desert part of Israel. Now, chapter uh, verse 10, we're going to spend the rest of the time, we don't have too much time left, but we're going to spend the rest of the time on verse 10, and you'll see why. Now there was a famine in the land, so Abram went down to Egypt to sojourn there, for a famine was severe in the land. Now this is just so typical that that things were going fine. He was right with God. He had been building these altars. And then all of a sudden, out of the clear blue, a famine hit. A horrible famine. And isn't that like our lives as well? Everything is going along fine. Everything is, you're just, this is a routine. You're in it. Everything's going fine. And then the rug is pulled out from under you. And most people think, why did that happen? Everything was fine. And how we react or respond to that tells us very much as to what our relationship with the Lord is like. 
And for most people, it's not a pretty picture. So I'm going to give you points. I'm going to give them in numbers so you can follow these because each one of these points happens to be important. Number one, there are two kinds of pressure in life. I guess maybe, would you like it if I put these on the board? Would that uh, help? Okay. Here you go. Okay, this is point number one. There are two kinds of pressures in life. Adversity is the inevitable kind of pressure. That is, outside daily pressure of life attacks us and seeks to penetrate our soul. So that is what happened here. Abram was just going about his way, and uh, something, listen, when a major drought hits, when, it, when it's a famine, it's drought, they can't produce food, you have a real, a real problem, and most people, even probably Abram was thinking, what, what is this all about? But it is inevitable. You know, a lot of people think if you had more money, if you were rich, you wouldn't have as many problems. Well, let me ask you something. When a famine hits, do the rich people suffer as well? Of course they do. When a hurricane hits, well, if you're a multimillionaire, does that do, do you any good? When Harvey was hitting hit did the rich people have a have it easier no so inevitably something is going to happen and we need to know why and what to do about it number two stress is what happens inside the soul there's adversity all outside but it can't penetrate unless we allow it to and it's what's going on in here that causes stress. Listen to this very carefully. It is not the adversity that causes stress. It's your lack of trusting God and not knowing doctrine that causes stress. So stress is what happens inside the soul. God takes us from the instant of salvation through a series of tests in order to reveal the flaws and failures of our own carnal sinful nature. So if we had it nothing but easy, there were never any adversity. We just sat around the house and ate bonbons all day and everything was lovely. Then God couldn't show us how despicable we really are or how much we need Him. And when tests come along, wow, do they ever get our attention. Number three. So adversity is the outside pressure. Stress is the inside pressure of the soul caused by the reaction to external pressures of adversity. You know, so many people think, you ask them, uh, how, how was your day? Or a lot of times I'll be passing somebody, and I do this uh, so many times, I don't even know them. They'll pass by and I say, how you doing? And they say, fine. I say, good. And we keep... Walking on. I mean, it's kind of like a form, it's not a formal greeting, but it's just a gesture of friendliness. But do I really want to know how they're doing? Well, I don't have time to know how they're doing. I mean, I might ask them, how are you doing? If somebody ever stops and says, well, I'm glad you asked. And I'm in a hurry, and they're going to give me a whole litany of the history of what all the ills are. And But most people think if their day is good, they base it, on is there any adversity or not. And the more adversity there is, the worse their day is. And so if you ask somebody, how's your day? And they're going to tell you, oh, it's horrible. What are they going to be describing? The outside pressure of adversity. And what they're doing, and they don't acknowledge it, they don't know it, what they're doing is letting you know they're not trusting the Lord. They're not applying doctrine. Number four, we have to learn to be dependent upon God and His provision. We have to learn that because it is our natural inclination not to trust the Lord, but to trust in whom? Moi. Us. 
ourselves. This is, I mean, uh, either God can't handle it or he's too busy. I, I, I'm, I have to do it or it won't be done. That's the attitude. So we have to learn to be dependent upon God and his provision. We cannot grow from spiritual infancy to spiritual maturity without being tested. You're going to be tested. You might be being tested right now because of what I'm telling you. You might not like it. And there's a lot of pastors that won't go there. Oh, you're fine, I'm fine, God's fine, and everything's fine. Nonsense. Everything's not fine. It's not God's fault. It's our fault. And we've got to know what to do about it and how to do it. Point number five. Believers who have not consistently taken in the Word of God automatically emote and think human viewpoint when tested. And that just doesn't happen sometimes. That happens all the time. Their soul is flooded with mass. Capital M-A-S always stands for what? Mental attitude sins. So if you hadn't been to Bible class in a month, if you hadn't been reading your Bible, praying maybe every once in a while, and the rug is pulled out from underneath you, you it's guaranteed you're going to start being, you're going to emote. And you're going to be full of fear, anxiety, anger, you're going to be discombobulated. You're going to be confused. Point number six. Adversity or outside pressure has two categories. There's two categories to this kind of pressure. Number one, suffering from the law of volitional responsibility or what we call divine discipline. Sometimes we suffer not because everybody's suffering, not because Hurricane Harvey came in, but because of our own bad decisions, our rebellion, our disobedience, our disrespect, and our avoidance and ignorance of God. So suffering from the law of original responsibility, divine discipline, two sub-points. A, there's a certain amount of suffering we go through and we have to ask the question, is this from my own doing or is this just the result of living in a fallen world? In other words, when famine hit with, with Abram, he had to think, is this because of me? Well, it's, it's hitting everybody. Is it, is it because, is this discipline for me? How do, and, and if he, how do you make the, the decision whether it's because of this decision, uh, discipline or not? First of all, let's reinforce that this is, is when it's discipline. Galatians chapter 6 verse 7. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man sows, that is what he also reaps. So if you think you can go around and abuse people, and ignore God and do whatever the heck you think you want to do without consequences, then this verse is for you. That's self-deception. So when you go against God, you go against people, then what you're doing is bringing the wrath of God down on you. It will certainly come. Now here's the B to this. When we suffer for discipline, we can convert it into suffering for blessing now let's stop right there for a second. I didn't say that when we suffer, we may ask that question. Oh, wait a minute, I'm up here on B. When we suffer for discipline, it doesn't say we can do something to get rid of the suffering, does it? Notice, we still, we still, we still be suffering. Not always, but usually. So when we are suffering for discipline, we can convert it into suffering for blessing when we confess our sins and start applying doctrinal solution that matches our situation. So what I'm saying is, when you are hurting and there's suffering in your life and you're wondering, is this divine discipline? Or is it just for everyone? Am I caught up in a drought situation? Or, or whatever it may be. The way to handle that situation is just go to the Lord if have, what, what was the last, when was the last time you acknowledged your sin? For some, it might be five minutes ago. 
if you acknowledge your sins five minutes ago, it's pretty sure that's probably not for discipline. Unless you're exceptionally naughty that day. But if it's not, or if you, if you, if you find a sin lurking about and you acknowledge it, boom, instantly it converts from suffering for discipline to suffering for blessing. And some of you might be thinking, oh, well, yeah. Well, so what? I mean, still suffering. I want to get rid of the suffering. Here's the difference between suffering for discipline and suffering for blessing. Suffering for discipline is unbearable. Suffering for blessing is bearable. And it strengthens you. You know one way you can tell if you're, if you're suffering for blessing or discipline? Get ready for this one. You're not going to like it. It's going to hurt. It's if you're complaining. If you're complaining, then you can be guaranteed it's not suffering for blessing. Because you don't get the picture. God has to bring these into your life so that you can grow, so that you can exercise your spiritual muscles, so that you can rely on Him, become closer to Him. And if you're complaining, you don't get it. Now, I'm going to make a little proviso here. You may be going home in the car, and you might be the husband driving and somebody cuts you off, cuts you off short. Uh, they do something that uh, aggravates you or there might be a detour. And if you're like me, it's like an automatic button when I'm slowed down on the road. For any reason, it's like a, 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 a sign in my head that says, complain, 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 complain. It just goes off in my head, so I have to complain. Oh, I know y'all can't y'all can't identify with that. So when I am complaining, or when you're complaining, you're making it worse. God is out of the picture. When you acknowledge your sin to God, then you are humble. Then He can have a rapport with you. You can talk to Him. You can depend upon Him. You can thank Him for the solution that He's going to provide and enable you to get through whatever situation it may be. All right, here's the, that was the first one. That was for uh, suffering for discipline. The other one is this one. Sometimes we suffer. When we suffer, we may ask the question, is, my own, is this my own doing or is it just the result of living in a falling world? Okay, well, I've done all that. Here's the second type of suffering, is that which is not related to our own volition. It is suffering that is the result of living in a fallen world. Suffering that God allows to come into our lives and is classified as suffering for blessing. But let me tell you something. This is what we ought to pray, that we will suffer, suffer for blessing. Because you're either going to suffer for blessing or you're going to suffer for discipline. Get it out of your head that you're not going to suffer because you're going to suffer. Everybody suffers. It depends on whether it's going to be bear, bearable and be to your benefit or whether it's going to be unbearable and you're going to act like a spiritual baby. Suffering for blessing is designed to accelerate spiritual growth. And I want to get spiritual growth in a big way. But to be honest, I'd rather not suffer for it. But what I just say, I'm going to suffer anyway. So if we're going to suffer anyway, why not make it usable, beneficial, and bearable? So here's a sub-point under suffering for blessing. Suffering for blessing is designed to accelerate spiritual growth. A, God brings adversity into our, into our life for us to learn to trust Him. We must learn to recognize that he is in control and we are completely dependent upon him. You see, if you really thought that, if you recognize how dependent we are on him, then you would go to him sooner. 
<clears throat> he is in control and we are completely dependent upon Him. And either you did something to bring this on, divine discipline, or else He is bringing this suffering into your life for your benefit. B, we must recognize that He is more powerful than our circumstances. He is omnipotent. So many times, <clears throat> something happens, and you know what happens. I mean, there's a whole host of things that could happen. But most of the time, when something happens that is unjust, it's just heartful, it's just nearly unbearable, what's the first thing we do? We don't go to the Lord in prayer. We, do. we pick up, I wish I had my cell phone here. Here, I'll use this. Uh, guess what happened now? <laughs> you go on and on. You want everybody in the world to know about it. But does God know about it? Did you go to Him first? Hallelujah. Yeah, yeah hallelujah. Okay. <laughs> we need to go to Him first. And when we do, then we can relax. Because He's in control. It's us out there maneuvering and going all around back and forth trying to handle the issue that brings on misery when we could be happy. This is I should have put this in the note right here. You can be happy. You can have joy in the midst of suffering, anguish even. If you're talking to the Lord, and you know why? Let me tell you why. Is because if you're going to the Lord in the in the midst of horrible suffering, you're going to Him and you ask Him to 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 take your burden to help you, whatever it is, you're going to see Him work on your behalf, and that's going to make you happy. That's that's joyous to think that you have the God of the universe on your side, and because you're trusting Him, He's all powerful. He can do anything. Have him on your side? Wouldn't that make you happy too? Stop wanting there to be no suffering. There's always suffering. Of some, we have the charge of the mosquito and we have the charge of the elephant. And here's the thing. Our God loves us so much that even on the, with the charge of the mosquito, <clears throat> He wants us to trust Him and to go to Him with it. You can't bother God. You've never said a prayer in your life that bothered God. And you never will. He, he, he can't be bothered. He wants to have, have your every thought, your every desire, your every need, all of that. He wants to interact with you. And, let, and yet a lot of people say, oh, I don't want to bother God with that. I nearly blow a gasket when I hear that. Are you kidding me? What does it say in the Bible? Pray always. <clears> hmm. <throat> Okay, um, so we learn to recognize He is in control and we are completely dependent upon Him. Last two points here. B, we must recognize that He is more powerful than our circumstances because He's omnipotent. I don't know why I like this phrase. God can unscramble eggs. Do you know anybody else that can do that? He made the chicken. See, our spiritual growth is directly linked to our ability to to our ability to trust the Lord. We've got too many words in there. There's, there it is. Our spiritual growth is directly linked to our ability to trust the Lord. And when you have adversity that comes into your life, the first thing you need to think of. God's getting my attention. He wants me to trust Him. And I can either trust Him or I can go it alone. Well, I've gone past a little bit this morning. I'm going to close out this Memorial Day as I always do, making sure that if there's anyone out there that is not sure about where their final destiny is going to be spent this last portion is for you. And it's the good news. It's the great news. <clears throat> and that news is that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He went to the cross to die for your sins, the sins of the world. 
He was buried, he rose from the dead, and now he offers eternal life to anyone who will trust him and him alone for it. It's not about being good. It's not about your works. It's about Christ and what he did. The moment that you accept the free gift of eternal life by believing in Jesus Christ, and that's the only way it's given as a free gift. You can't work for it. If you work for a gift, it's no longer a gift. The moment that you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, then you are born again. You are a royal family member of the Most High. Your ticket to heaven is guaranteed. And now it's time to get ready to get that suffering for blessing. Heavenly Father, we thank you for those who have gone before us who gave their lives in order to keep us free. Pray for Caleb that you'll watch over him, keep him safe. We also pray for our nation desperately needs to understand that it's not in the weapons, the power, or the money, or anything else that will deliver us. It's only you. And we need to turn from our wicked ways in in ignoring you and start living in obedience and subjection to you. And we won't have to worry about the wars because you will fight our battle for us. What a wonderful God. So we thank you for all these things and pray that you will help us to remember them and apply them in our life. For we pray this all in Christ's most high and holy name. Amen. We'll prepare ourselves this morning in our usual fashion. We'll have a few moments of silent prayer. And during that time, we have the opportunity to name privately to God the Father any unconfessed sins which ensures the filling of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your faithfulness and the fact that you are the God of freedom and you give us our rights that come from you to be able to be free. We thank you for those.